Melinda, today's topic is neuro-Turing machines. I imagine we'll have to break that down right out of the gate, correct? Yep. Well, let's start with Turing machines. So a Turing machine, I actually think we did an episode on this a while back, but the high level of it is it's a model of computation. It's basically where computer science comes from. This is why we say Alan Turing is kind of the founder. He had this idea for a very simple mechanical computer that involves just a infinitely long tape of memory and a read-write head that can go back and forth on the tape And depending on what the cell says and what its internal state is, it can either change the memory there or go left or go right and just runs back and forth. I like to picture like a 1970s printer, you know, with this thing whirling back and forth and making a lot of noise. Yeah, well, I saw the movie, so that's what I'm imagining. What movie? Well, we saw the movie with the Cumberbatch guy. Yeah, same character, different story. So that's about the enigma and the code breaking that Turing did there. The actual Turing machine itself doesn't come up in that movie, nor, in fact, does the imitation game, which is the name of the movie. Hmm, interesting. (laughs) Yeah, but it's an appropriate thing because the imitation game is his way of testing for artificial intelligence that we covered on our episode called The Imitation Game, I think, earlier. Yeah, early last year, I think so. But anyway, the Turing machine is just a model of computation. I was asking you if you could picture one. Have you seen one in real life? Oh, no, I have not. Have you? Well, technically, no, because I've never seen anything with an infinitely long tape. I have seen a couple of, like, proof of concepts, like people did it just to do it. But really, there's no reason to build a Turing machine the way it's described. Uh, There are better ways to manufacture a computer. But the point of the Turing machine is sort of more of a thought experiment. I mean, you can build them, but... It's more just to say that even this simple, very basic mechanical machine that, you know, a small child could probably put together, it does everything a modern computer can do, just slower. Everything. Yeah. And the flip side to that statement, maybe the stronger statement is, it will not happen that a very clever person comes along and thinks up a better machine than a Turing machine. Mm -hmm. Even if their machine is better, like, oh, we made the paper feed is improved so the tape doesn't get stuck. And we have two read heads and they can communicate with each other. We have two write tapes. There are all these little variations and they do give you definite efficiencies in building faster machines and easier to use machines. But the machines can't do anything that the simple Turing machine can't do. It's totally capable. Okay, well, they are probably limited by software availability, right? Because the Turing machine is a very basic or early computer. Yeah, so think of the Turing machine as the combination of the hardware and the software. I mean, the hardware is just the tape and the read head. The software is whatever you initialize the tape to say, which also has the instructions to the machine on what to do. So, yeah, you would, I guess, have to have a compiler to the Turing language if you wanted to have an actual Turing machine, because it's all just binary zeros and ones. Right. So all the the easy out of the box software that we have today didn't exist back then. But it all could run on a Turing machine. There'd be no problem with that. Yes. Now if listeners didn't follow any of that, let me give you the most simple explanation. A Turing machine is just a computer. That's all it is. When I say that think computer, the nuances are just in the technical details of its implementation and the profound consequences we can realize from studying such a model. But let's get to the neuro part. What would you imagine a neuro Turing machine does or is? Well, I don't know. What does neuro mean? Let's break that down. Do you know what neuro means? It means relating to nerves or the nervous system. I wish the word brain had shown up in there because that's how I think of it. But yeah, nervous system, I guess. Well, there you go. So what does it mean when there's a Turing machine and a nervous system? I don't even know. What do you think? Well, think more about neuro like neurology, like studying the brain rather than the nervous system, because I think our analogy will get a little slippery. But basically, it's a type of deep learning architecture in which the deep learning system is also given a memory. Do you have any concept of what it means to give an algorithm a memory? I mean, in my head, I would imagine it just means you're remembering what happened. That's past. Right, but you have a finite amount of space to store those memories in, let's say. Right. What does your brain do? Because your brain didn't store every memory of every experience you ever had in your life. Yeah, I don't know. I actually don't know how the brain works, so I'm interested to hear more. What does my brain do? Well, I'm not going to talk about its mechanism of what exactly it does neurologically, but I know what it does practically, and it forgets. 
well, does it prioritize things? There must be some prioritization, it, uh, not that we control it. I mean, I guess to some extent we do, right? Like we can we come can up- control it, absolutely. Yeah, a little bit, but then like not perfectly, right? There are times that we maybe things we would prefer not to remember, we can remember and stuff like that. Well, there's trauma, so uh-huh. some things that are tied to a strong emotional feeling can be remembered very easily. And that's really for instinct reasons, because if there was trauma, maybe they don't, they want you to be hyper vigilant and stay away from those situations again. Yeah, now that's actually very re- a very reinforcement learning approach you just expressed there, Linda. Good job. Yeah, so it's not like your brain's just remembering to remember, it remembers for a re- reason, to protect you. Right. We're going to try and build a machine that can do the same thing. We'll call a neuro-Turing machine sort of a broad class of deep learning frameworks where we give the machine not just a memory, but like a programmable memory. So it's able to use those attention mechanisms we've been talking about recently, where the machine kind of learns what to focus on. And it learns how to encode things into its memory in an effective way. And then it learns what parts of those things to pay attention to. Does the distinction of those two steps, is it clear to you? So where to encode it and priority. Yeah, I'm going to make you say attention, though, because that's the key word. <laughs> What's attention mean? Um, attention, it, I mean, we've been talking about it in recent episodes, so I guess I didn't do a great job explaining it. But essentially, it's a statistical distribution that the algorithm has that tells it what parts of its input or its memory to focus on. So you could imagine like if you're driving down the street, uh, you're probably not paying attention to what's in your lap. You know, you're paying attention to objects outside the car. Maybe you're paying attention to the brake pedal because you might switch to braking. But, you know, your attention is focused on the things that are important to your task at hand. So it's called attention in computer science world? Yep. Specifically in deep learning. I mean, I guess you could put attention into other algorithms, but you want to uh, allow the algorithms to learn where they should focus their attention. Yes, I do remember us talking about this now. So when you think about those two qualities that uh, maybe a machine that's allowed to train long enough or has a rich enough data set, if it could learn how to put information in its memory, what would that mean? I don't know. Does memory look like anything? Um, Well, yeah, you can visualize it because it's just bits in memory, right? It's zeros and ones. Okay, so I guess that's what it would look like, zeros and ones, if if that's what it looks like. Yeah, so a lot of the papers on these, they do show some of the imagery that tries to visualize the memory. Do you know what zeros and ones look like when they're all randomly strewn about? I don't know. I just, to me, it looks like zeros and ones. So I, I didn't have any deeper thought. Does it look like a cow to you? No, it's <laughs> static is what I was going to say. But, oh, static. So you think static looks like that. Interesting. Yeah. If you just flipped a coin once for every pixel on your monitor and, you know, heads was black, tails was white, the resulting image you would get would look like static almost all of the time. Rarely would it suddenly look like our logo, right? One in a huge number of chances. Yeah, I guess I I didn't think of that. I guess static, you're saying it's black and white, right? Mm-hmm. But sometimes when they're black and white next to each other, it'll look gray. True. So are you suggesting zeros and ones look like that? Well, and technically, I, I should have said grayscale, like you're pointing out, because in this memory, you can store a floating point number. It doesn't have to be a bit zero and one, even though it's a valid representation. You're just allowing the machine to store some numeric data. So it could be grayscale, yeah. Okay. And uh, actually, if you visualize these, they tend to look a little bit like static, um, which is actually a a good sign in a way, because that means that they have the maximum amount of information possible. If there was any regularity, then the memory is not being used efficiently. Regularity. Yeah. Why would regularity mean that it's not being used efficiently? Well, let's take a simple case like that. um, So picture a 2D matrix, right? And that's your memory. And you can put a bunch of values into that matrix. If the first row is always zero no, everywhere in the memory, then you don't even need the first row. It's not useful for anything because the value is always the same. So why didn't you use that space to store some information? So you're saying the first row, if it was all zeros, you're asking why wouldn't something use it to store information? Yeah, it was inefficient in some way. It's like having a bunch of empty Word files on your hard drive just taking up small amounts of space. So zero means there's nothing stored there? 
no, zero means it's a zero there, but hopefully your memory has useful information in it that you can retrieve later. Because if, if you just did something stupid, like every time you had a chance to put something in your memory, you just rolled dice and stored the random numbers, that's not going to be useful for you. You want to remember past events and important ones. And so we already mentioned that hopefully our machines will learn how to record important events and maybe not record unimportant events, or I should say information, not just events. But then also we want to retrieve it later. So that means putting something in the right spot. What if I wanted to count the number of times our bird Yoshi has whistled at me today? I would need to put that number somewhere in memory, and I would always need to store just that information about Yoshi there and not store like how many slices of pizza I had. That should be in a different cell. I'm not sure how this relates to zeros in a row and being efficient. You're going to use all of your memory in different ways. So if maybe I have one cell of memory that I use as a counter for how many times Yoshi whistled at me, another cell for how many pieces of pizza I've had today, uh, another cell for how many lines of code I've written or what project I'm working on, and eventually I'm going to fill up my memory with all those facts. Along the way, if I want to retrieve a fact, I have to put it in a way that I'm going to be able to get to it later. If I want to know how many times Yoshi whistled and I can't tell the difference between the cell holding the number of times she whistled and the cell with the number of pieces of pizza I've eaten, then I have to guess which value is the right one. Like what, you're guessing where it's stored? Yeah. You, is that what you mean when you say guessing which cell? Yeah, that's what it would mean if I was making that error. And the error is what? Not putting information in your memory in a systematic way where you can retrieve it. So that's an error. Yeah, well, it's... I don't know about an error. It's a, an undesirable property. You'd like to make the best use of your memory. I mean, I guess it depends when you say best use, when you say efficiency, you're saying you just want to store more, even if the order could be random. Store more, even if the order could be random. Well, we don't care about the order, so I guess that's true. I wouldn't necessarily call it random because it is organized in some way, but we're not controlling how it gets organized. Right, so you're prioritizing just you want it efficiently stored, like storing more, and that's your metric. Yeah. Thanks to this week's sponsor, the University of San Francisco, and their Applied Economics degree program. This is the only program in the whole world that focuses 100% on training economists to work in the tech sector. USF students get an economist's understanding of markets and causal inference along with the data science skills they need to make practical contributions. If you're looking to get into tech or take a pivot in your career, economics is a very novel entry point. And what better place to study the field but in San Francisco at the epicenter of the global technology industry? Having a deep understanding of economics will give you the ability to study platforms, auctions, pricing, reputation, and business strategy. Econometrics is a far-reaching and widely applicable discipline. These skills are in high demand. In the private sector, you can work for the businesses building the new economy. Or in the public and nonprofit sectors, perhaps you can design policies that make sure that tech innovations will benefit everyone. Learn more about the program and obtain an application waiver fee at usfca.edu skeptic. They are now accepting applications for the fall. So take the next step in your education. Visit usfca.edu slash skeptic. But if there is something like a category for breakfast, you don't care that breakfast, eggs, and bacon are on the same row. That doesn't matter to you. Oh, well, that's a good concept. You're on the right track there. So those things are related. We would hopefully store them in the memory in either like overlapping places or we would encode them in so that they're, they're sort of similar yet also differentiable. They're all or not different. Not differentiable like in calculus, but that you can tell the difference between them. Let me give you a more concrete example. Let's assume, picture this big matrix you have that's all your memory. Parts of it are going to light up when they're important. The way you determine if they're important is through the attention mechanism. So let's say you were parsing a sentence that started, tomorrow morning, and that's all I've said so far, probably all the breakfast words would light up, or you would think so, right? Because that's a very likely thing that's going to be relevant for the next part of the sentence. It might also light up some areas of your attention that relate to your job because, you know, a lot of people get up and go to their job. So it could be like in the morning, schedule an appointment or a meeting or something like that. So if I just say tomorrow morning, 
you don't know yet, is it about breakfast or is it about your job? But those are likely candidates. So the attention needs to update to help the machine focus on the parts of memory that have useful information in them. Okay, so then various areas of the memory are lighting up. Because somehow the attention mechanism knows that that's where the important facts are. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's dispersed throughout the memory. That isn't calculated at a cost. What do you mean by dispersed? Like I said, like, so breakfast, bacon, Mm -hmm. eggs, and grits might be on row one. But you're saying the way it's laid out, it doesn't work like that because the memory doesn't care where it goes. It only cares by efficiency. Efficiency as prioritized by space, but not by category, for example. So I've kind of oversimplified a little bit for you. Let me back up a little bit. First of all, in the memory, it's not that it doesn't care where they're stored. It's that it wants to first embed them. So there's something called an embedding space, which is like almost another language. So you first translate the knowledge you have into that language. So how should the translation take place? Who decides the translation process? Well, that gets learned. You're trying to learn an efficient way of translating from what you have to some nice representation that can go in your memory. And you can do that an infinite number of ways. So how do we decide what's the best way to do it? Well, the best way is such that you find the, you know, I'm watering it down here, but the best way to store information in your memory is in such a way that it's going to be useful in the future. I just don't understand what the metric is of useful. Aha. Okay. So useful is you're confronted with some problem. So let's make it simple like a gambling exercise, like poker or something. You know what cards you have. You know some things about the bets on the table and stuff like that. And you also have your memory. So what would be useful to the game? Well, if you remember the way people have played in the past, like, you know, someone bluffs too much, then you might assume that they're going to bluff now, although it could be a double play sort of thing. So having a keen sense of observing other people's strategies is a way of um, making it efficient, right? So if you're good at summing people up and saying, aha, I know how that person plays, I figured out their tell, I can read them very well, and storing that in your memory then you're able to better perform in the game because in addition to all the things at face value, like the cards, you also have things in your memory that are going to help you win. Right. So how does this priority relate back to what we're saying? I understand it in a poker game, but I don't understand what does it have to do with what we're talking about? Well, let's lock in the concepts to the poker game then. So the memory is knowing a player's tell, right? That's one thing you would want out of your memory. Attention is pointing you to where you observe the tell. So like, let's say someone scratches their uh, temple when they're nervous and, and bluffing. That fact goes in your memory. Attention says, watch his temple, see if he scratches. And then the embedding space, the sort of analogy there is you figured out that someone scratching their temple is an important feature. Because maybe you didn't know that when you sat down, but you observed it and you learned that. So that's embedding the data. You figured out that information. You're storing it in a smart way. Then you're retrieving it and using it. So it's most efficient because you're winning the game the most. And whichever, you know, is the winning strategy, whichever makes you the most money, that's the best way to do it, right? So efficient to you just means you succeed in whatever you're trying to do at the time. Yes. So let me give you a slightly more academic view before I, because I feel like you're going to disagree with me on some philosophical point. I picked poker because it's obvious, like whoever makes the most money wins, you know, but in life, who wins? Well, I mean, that's debatable. Everyone has a different objective function that they're optimizing towards. So, you know, you could be optimizing for how far you get in your career. I could be optimizing for how good of a musician I am. Everyone's doing something different, but we would pick strategies that optimize to our unique goals. I don't understand. So everyone has different metrics of efficiency. So what does that have to do with the Turing machine? Okay. So this is where the Turing machine part of it comes in. So it's not just that it has memory, but it's trying to learn the instructions that a Turing machine would follow to compute something. So it's like it's trying to learn a program almost. You train an algorithm to learn the program that 
finds the solution you're looking for. So what does that have to do with the Turing machine, though? Because the Turing machine is the model of the computation. It's the model? I thought it was like mm -hmm. the platform. Yeah. It's, that's how one would execute the computation. Move left, move right, update this cell. So you're going to encode, simulate that process, but learn the right procedure. So then what does this have to do with poker? So if the scenario was poker, then your inputs would be all of the observations you've had about the game, who, what cards are in your hand, so on and so forth. And the output is your play, like how much you want to bet and if you want to fold and that kind of stuff. So you would evolve a strategy program that would say, under these conditions, do this. Under these conditions, do something else. I guess for me, what do you want me to learn from this conversation? If there was like one takeaway, I feel like for me, I heard a lot of things about poker, how you remember certain things. I heard a lot of things about the Turing machine, about how that's the platform. You're calling it the model. Other people are saying attention. There's a lot of words floating around. But I still don't understand what you want me to learn. Well, if you want to learn just one high-level thing, it's that this constitutes an advancement in neuroarchitecture. That we have a very smart step forward in pursuit of artificial intelligence. But what was happening previously? Translation is a good example. For a long time, and even still, machine translation wasn't perfect. It was a hard problem to solve. And now it's kind of getting solved. So what's the next hardest problem? And what will and why can't today's algorithms and methodologies solve that one? And you know, maybe it's because they're not scaled up enough, or maybe it's because they're not clever enough. So we need to be more clever. And this is an example of cleverness. So you're saying the most important thing for me to take away is that prior before prior to the Turing machine. Uh, there was just a different way of thinking and solving problems that you think was not as efficient. Yes, and not as capable. And then, But what year was the Turing machine made? I thought it was like 60s, 70s, 80s? Yes, that, that's why this is the neuro-Turing machine, which I believe the first publication was 2015 or 2016. Oh, so the neuro-Turing machine is now a new version. Does it sit somewhere or do multiple people own it? Uh, no, it's just a paper. Like I could go write a paper about it if I had some novel observation. It's just in the literature. I mean, there's an original person who coined the term and all that. I'd have to look up their name. They're the, one of the original paper. I think there's three authors, but, um, no, it's just a concept, just like matrix is a concept. Anyone can talk about it. So someone named the concept. So they somehow, did they discover something by doing it? Yes, I guess. I, the word discovery sits a little wrong with me because, you know, I don't know, math never feels like it's discovered to me. It's always there and we just learn the proof or in this case, learn the methodology. But he took or the authors took a very classic idea of the Turing machine and want to take advantage of the fact that it's universal, it can solve any problem and then say, well, can we find a way for machine learning to learn the software we want. So they asked a question. So they didn't actually discover anything. They're just asking questions. Yes. And they're getting good answers to many of those questions. If you ask a simple algorithm to solve a complex problem, you'll get nonsense answers. Um, this is a more complex algorithm. You're asking a more complex question and it's getting very good results. Or in this case, I mean, what they did in the paper here was solve simple things like evolve an algorithm that does sorting, because that's a very fundamental thing. But the ultimate questions of machine learning are, how do we get to artificial general intelligence, right? How do we design and develop these systems so that any problem a human mind can solve, a machine can solve? That's the, the ultimate gold standard, right? I mean, I never really thought about what the gold standard was. Anything that is learnable will get a machine to learn. Okay. Well, then it sounds like within the realm of computer science, this seems to have struck you as very important. So I'm glad you shared it with me. Thank you, Kyle. Not necessarily milestone important. I think this is more of just a general framework, although it definitely has some real world applications it can be used for, I'm sure. But a, you know, a step in a direction where we can talk about theoretical boundaries on computation and machine learning and uh, I don't know, just a very good theoretical result in that regard, too. 
So anyway, thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs>